So our next session is on the international context. Um, we're talking about political representation of disabled people and we have some learning from the international context and initiatives. <clears throat> so to chair that session, I feel I've lost the room somehow. <laughs> to chair that session, I have Noelle O'Connor, uh, no, no, pardon me, Noelle O'Connell, who's CEO of the European Movement Ireland, which is Ireland's largest and longest established not-for-profit membership organisation dedicated to developing the connection between Ireland and Europe. And Noelle is also, <coughs> pardon me, Vice President of the European Movement International and a voluntary director of the board of Alliance Francaise Ireland. This is another hybrid session. So two of our speakers are joining us from online. And um, one of them is joining us here in the room, Alejandro Molido uh, from EDF. So I'm going to invite Noel to uh, begin chairing this uh, hybrid session. And uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Aideen, and uh, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, uh, a very warm welcome to you all that are here in person and online. And I think Alejandro and I and, and our, our colleagues who are joining us online, I don't want to say we've drawn the short straw in the last session, but uh, we'll just go with that we're leaving the best to last, right? <laughs> um, I'm delighted uh, to be here with you this afternoon, not only chairing session five, but we really have uh, three fantastic speakers to hear from today. And it's just really brilliant. I've, I've had the opportunity to sit in on the last panel and uh, to listen to such inspiring speakers and be front of such an engaged audience. Uh, who have uh, shown up in, in great numbers today. If, if any of our own EM Ireland events, we'd love to get a, 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 as large and engaged and active an audience as this, so, so fair play to you all. So the purpose of this session, we're going to discuss uh, the political participation of disabled people from an international perspective. Um, and I'm hoping that uh, some of the takeaways will include us all learning about what works, what doesn't work, and um, maybe some different examples of political participation of disabled peoples in different European countries and, and to apply those to an Irish context. So to help us examine this important topic this afternoon and to share their expertise, um, I'm delighted to welcome our panel of three very distinguished speakers. Uh, firstly, on my left, um, Alejandro Moledo, he, and Alejandro is the Deputy Director and Head of Policy at the European Disability Forum, and we're delighted that he's here with us in, in person in Dublin. And then online, we have Ethan Young, uh, Civic Participation Manager with the Access to the Elected Office Fund at Inclusion Scotland, and I, I see, him, uh, see Ethan on, on the screen there as well, so technology is working, which is always a relief. And then lastly, but by no means least, delighted that we will be joined as well by Florian Sandin, Policy Coordinator at the European Network on Independent Living. So a very warm welcome to our speakers online and to Alejandro, who is with us here today. So in terms of housekeeping, we're going to hear um, from our three panelists and their opening remarks. We'll then move to audience Q&A, and, &A and uh, uh, obviously great to have questions from people that are here with us in person person and obviously those who are online will be able to submit their questions via Zoom. So I'm originally from uh, Blarney in County Cork, if you couldn't tell from the Cork accent, home to the Blarney Stone and in terms of the gift of the gab, I've already had my warning on the times and I know you're, you're running behind so we're probably standing in the way of all of you in a well-deserved coffee break in a wrap-up session. So I'll be asking our speakers to, to try and keep uh, to their time slot and I think we've a we have a very, uh, very red clock there giving us the timing, so that's that's great. Um, and then we'll be able to, to wrap up just after 3.30 to move on to the final session. And of course, for those of you active on social media, don't forget to use the, the Twitter or X, as I think it's called now, for today's events, uh, NDA Conf 23 and NDA Conference 2023. 
Um, and if I could just start by just saying one thing, as mentioned by the Commissioner for Human Rights of the Council of Europe, uh, Dunja Mecedovic, um, which I think really speaks to, this, uh, to the theme of this panel. The principle of nothing about us without us must ring true for people with disabilities as we move towards the next European Parliament elections in June 2024 and beyond. And I mean, I think from what we've heard today that people with disabilities are ready to lead the way forward in policy making and that political context must reflect their resilience and ambition. So without further ado, I would like to invite our first speaker, Alejandro, to deliver his opening remarks and kick off this session. Alejandro, thank you. Thank you very much. How much time we have? Mm -hmm. How much time we have? I think it's ten, ten minutes. Ten minutes time. Well, thank you very much and many thanks to the NDA for inviting us. Uh, I'm really pleased to be here with you in Dublin. So yeah, my name is Alejandro Moledo and I work at the European Disability Forum, um, which is the umbrella organization bringing together the European disability movement. Uh, we're members, uh, we have European and national members, national members uh, like DFI here in Ireland and uh, representing the disability community in each member state, but also European members representing the different disability groups such as the European Blind Union, the European Union of the Deaf, Autism Europe, Inclusion Europe, and so forth. Wait, because I don't know if I'm... Yeah, so I cannot see my slide. Ah, yeah, maybe here. So uh, I will be complementing um, what it was already said this morning by, um, by Armin uh, Rabic uh, from, uh, from Election Watch EU because um, we, co we partner with them in order to um, come up with this report that he was presenting. I will be showing you other uh, bits of that report and then uh, conclude with some uh, further looking ideas and the plans for EDF for the upcoming European election and how we can um, you know, move forward the agenda of the disability movement. We do uh, publish these reports every year focused on one article of the CRPD. So uh, last year was the Article 29. This year has been Article 27 on employment. Next year, uh, we'll publish a human rights report on um, on equality before the law, in which Ireland you you are definitely uh, showing progress in this regard. So in these reports, we kind of compare member states and bring those practices uh, that actually uh, have a substantial change. So not of this kind of one-off uh, project that then they get forgotten. Um, so, sorry, because I don't see the slides in which I am, so, ah, but you can hear me if I move, no? Yes. Okay, so I don't know if that is disturbing or not. I will just go very quickly through the slides because you've been already listening about what um, the, the research has shown in terms of the legal barriers and also the practical barriers when it comes to political participation of persons with disabilities. We, we've seen that uh, there has been progress in member states. We now have more than half of member states that recognize the right to vote without any restriction, without any um, exception based on legal incapacitation in most, uh, most cases, but unfortunately the countries in which um, the right to stand as candidate uh, is less, fewer than those with um, uh, recognizing the right to, to vote. So um, I don't know if I'm in the right uh, slides, but I will just, okay, I now there you go. The right to stand as uh, as candidate. There are actually around there are nine uh, member states in which this right is uh, recognised, and I will conclude with some some considerations about them. But just first, I wanted to to ask you how many MEPs, members of the European Parliament, do you think there are with disabilities, out of the 705? Any guess? No. Around there. As far as we know, there are only seven MEPs with disabilities out of the 705 uh, members, soon to be 720. So there is still very much room for improvement, as it was mentioned in previous panels, when it comes to the actual representation of persons with disability uh, among the policy makers. When it comes to other aspects a key to the uh, political participation of persons with disabilities, it was also mentioned uh, this morning, a key issue of accessibility. 
So to ensure equal access, we identify these um, uh, three elements which are uh, fundamental to ensure equal as access to elections. One is accessibility, another one is reasonable accommodation, which in most of cases uh, relate to those alternative or adv advanced means of voting, and the provision of assistive technologies, and finally the free choice of assistance. Because believe it or not, there are still two countries in the EU that do not allow persons with disabilities to freely choose a person to assist them in uh, casting the vote, even though this is explicitly mentioned in Article 29. So um, when it comes to accessibility, there are different elements that we looked at. We looked at the, um, the ballot papers and how to cast the vote. We've heard a really good example from internet voting in Estonia that is accessible. But for example, other means of electronic voting, such as voting machines that we use in Belgium, for example, those are not accessible. And then depending on how you vote, there are different ways in which you can maximize the accessibility of that ballot paper. So we looked at different examples. Uh, in the in the human rights report most most of times when um, politicians think of accessibility of elections they only think of uh, polling stations and uh, sometimes uh, polling uh, voting booths and we see that um, there is um, uh, 19 uh, member states in which this is included directly or indirectly in the in the national legislation so if we look at uh, then other elements crucial for the election, such as information to the voters or the media, political parties, we see that the situation is very, very different depending on, on, the, on the member states. We see elector, electoral management bodies that actually have a proactive approach and they cooperate with uh, organizations of persons with disabilities to, um, to produce uh, accessible uh, formats such as easy to read, uh, sign language, with support in order to inform about the elections as well as you know specific uh, campaigns to reach out to persons with disabilities. Um, when it comes to political parties and media, um, the media is a little bit more uh, regulated than political parties that in most European countries we see that there is um, a voluntary kind of approach towards making um, their campaigns uh, accessible and, and inclusive. And obviously, if they don't make themselves um, accessible and, and inclusive, there will be no possibility for many persons with disabilities to really uh, get into politics. So that is one of the aspects that we are stressing very much in order to increase the participation of persons with disabilities as candidates. And also, if we think that many political parties actually receive public funds, since we can include uh, requirements for other services that receive uh, public money, we should also uh, ensure that political uh, parties uh, live up to certain obligations and certain requirements. So yeah, I will just keep those, those bits that you can find in the, um, in the, in the report. I would, just I would just like to mention that among the, the recommendations that we include in this report, one of the I would say the most important one and the one that, that, that we bring more, m most lively in the, in the report is that the, the key aspect of cooperation between the, the disability organizations and the um, electoral um, authorities to come up with the solutions, because one thing is obviously the advocacy that the disability movement does to change the legal barriers, but also is key the advocacy towards changing those practical barriers that prevent persons with disabilities from participating in political and public life. So those examples that, uh, that uh, work the best are actually those that are uh, defined and agreed with uh, persons with disabilities. So some of the... Um, I will just keep, ah yeah, those are the, sorry, I don't see the screen and that's a little bit of an issue, I don't know where I am. And recommendations, the report, which I think there is still one copy uh, left and you can in any case uh, have it uh, in different accessible formats as well. But I wanted to just conclude with some um, 
information about what's EDF approach in, in this regard. We've been, as an advocacy organization, we work very closely with the European Commission, with the European uh, Parliament, and with the Council of the EU, which is the institution that represents the different uh, national governments. And we are working on different uh, policy files that li have a direct link with the political participation of persons with disabilities. The European Parliament has actually proposed a new European electoral law that includes most of EDF's uh, and our members' uh, demands on it, such as the right to vote, regardless of legal capacity, accessibility, reasonable accommodation, free choice of assistance, accessibility of campaigns, and so forth. But of course, the member states, they don't want to hear uh, Brussels telling them how they need to arrange their national elections. This is a very much, you know, national uh, competence. And obviously, even if we have a European Parliament election, in reality, we have 27 different um, uh, electoral system. The, the Commission does have competence for, uh, which we believe is a hook for us to really work also at national level to improve the situation concerning the political rights of mobile EU citizens, such as you know an Irish person that moves to Spain or vice versa, because then you have the right to vote in the municipal and in the European elections. So there are some provisions there that we are trying to push for in order to facilitate the participation of persons with disabilities. And finally, something that uh, will come up soon that you may want to check as well is that one of the actions of the disability strategy the commission is preparing a guide on inclusive pract uh, on best practices for inclusive uh, how it is for inclusive participation in elections something like that you know convoluted kind of long title very commi very commission style um, so we really want this guide to be practical, to give ideas to member state and electoral authorities on how they can uh, make their elections more accessible, how they can facilitate the participation of persons with disabilities, but we'll see, because for the moment we've been collaborating with them and giving them ideas and inputs, but we have not seen yet a draft, but it should be published before the end of the year. So we will let you know as soon as, as this is uh, available. And lastly, something that I, I want to, to mention, I think it was, and to conclude, it was already uh, brought up by, by John Dolan uh, before our, um, we organized last May a, a big uh, conference in the European Parliament, the European Parliament of Persons with Disabilities with over 700 disability advocates from all over Europe. And one of the main outcomes of this conference, in addition to show the strength and the commitment of persons with disabilities to the European movement, was to adopt the manifesto, the proposals that we are putting forward uh, to candidates and for the new European Commission after the elections in June. And in those uh, in that manifesto, we really, which was um, uh, created collaboratively with all the EDF members and all uh, delegates of this conference, it includes a broad range of uh, proposals from uh, non-discrimination, equality to accessibility, transport, um, uh, social policies, the, the role of the EU beyond the EU borders as well. So if you want more information, maybe in the q and I can give you a little bit of a flavor of what kind of proposals we're including it. And we are then uh, promoting this manifesto towards the, the upcoming European elections. We are reaching out to the European political parties to ensure that they incorporate these uh, proposals. We are telling them that their campaigns should be accessible. And more importantly, we are telling them that we want to see more candidates with disabilities in the next European elections, because there were very, very few in the previous one. And now this is a key message in our campaign towards the, the European elections. We, we haven't seen, uh, apart from Malta, that included a specific point in their disability national disability strategy in which they will support candidates with disabilities. We have not been, uh, we have not seen much of progress in uh, European political parties in this regard. But again, and this is my main message to you, this, even if we have European parties, uh, political party, this is something that it gets decided at national level, national, regional, local level. So we encourage very much all, all of you, all our members to use the manifesto to raise awareness about accessibility. We will be 
developing guidelines uh, for an accessible campaign and also to encourage that more and more persons with disabilities, as it was mentioned in the previous panel, run as candidates. So I will leave it there. Thank you so much and happy to answer any question later. Thank you. Thank you, Alejandro. That was uh, absolutely fas fascinating. And I might ask you just to take... Oh, sorry. Hang sorry. On. Oh, sorry. Apologies. Um, you're, you're sitting on the, on the agenda there, so we might, hang, we might need to hang on to that. Um, I just couldn't believe when you said that only seven MEPs in the whole um, European Parliament are, are people with disabilities. Absolutely incredible. And I look forward to picking up on some of the topics in terms of the European Parliament elections. But we'll keep going with our, with our speakers. And I've just figured out the, uh, the timing. When it goes red, that's the time we've gone over. Over. So, uh, going next to Scotland, um, apologies, I'm a very bad moderator, there you go. Um, Ethan, delighted to turn to you, um, and you are with the uh, Access to Elected Office Fund Inclusion Scotland, and you're the Civic Participation Manager, really looking forward to uh, getting the, your, the, the insights from Scotland. Over to you, thank you. Great, thank you very much for inviting me along today, it's great to be with you all. Uh, I'm already taking so much away with me, uh, and I, I really wish I was there to have a cup of tea with you all as well. Uh, I'm specifically going to talk about the Access to Elected Office Fund because I'm going to try and keep on time, uh, but I, I, want, I want to cover so much more with you, but hopefully uh, we can create some links today, uh, which would be good going forward. So the Scottish Government funded Access to Elected Office Fund uh, was first opened as a pilot in 2016 for the 2017 local authority elections. There were 44 applicants to the fund who covered 18 of the 32 local authority areas in Scotland. All of these applicants became recipients to the fund and were awarded support. 39 of the applicants became official candidates and 15 out of that 39 were elected. The overall spend for the fund that year was £81,000. This was seen as a success and proved that the fund can reduce many of the financial barriers that disabled people face when running for elected office on a more even playing field. Success, however, doesn't happen overnight and without strong will and dedication to a vision. Previous to the pilot, and before I joined Inclusion Scotland actually, there was a growing movement of disabled people who knew that, they were, that we were drastically underrepresented in political office. Disabled people were tired of only being the subject of consultation by decision makers instead of having equal access to becoming decision makers themselves. Disabled people already face additional costs to living, and these additional costs can be more extreme at the point of deciding to run for elected office. Something had to be done to support disabled people with these additional impairment-related costs. While Inclusion Scotland were lobbying politicians, a cross-party group of disabled activists called One in Five started a campaign. Within their asks for increased representation was a fund for disabled people running for elected office. They got all the parliamentary political parties to sign up to this pledge. Uh, and working together, we got politicians on board to push the creation of a fund and got cross-party support, and it passed. Standing orders had to be changed so that these reasonable adjustment costs didn't count towards campaign expenditure. Uh, a separate box was established to declare these costs in the campaign expenditure returns. The key was ensuring that these costs didn't count towards expenditure limits. Disabled people who intend to run for elected office can apply for the fund to help pay for the additional impairment-related costs that a non-disabled person wouldn't face. It's not about giving people an advantage. It's about levelling the playing field so that disabled people can fight elections with less barriers. The fund can pay for reasonable adjustments, such as communication support, uh, that can be British Sign Language, interpreters, a palantypist, note takers, personal assistance support, transport, software or equipment. There's no where, where money can 
and pay for something to reduce barriers, then you can apply to the fund for that. Where there's an impairment related barrier to doing campaign activities, the fund can be utilized basically. It can't be used for campaign expenditure though. We have an independent panel of disabled people with experience of reasonable adjustments and campaigning who make the award decisions and it's open for all Scottish elections, including by-elections. In 2020, the fund supported a candidate in a local authority by-election who became the first British Sign Language user to be elected into local government. In a case study, Grant Ferguson said, the battle was already lost before I could even say the word campaign. It came down to communication. If I could not communicate, I could not participate. My first language is BSL, British Sign Language. Without the assistance of BSL interpreters, there were insurmountable barriers to my participation in branch meetings and engagement with the public. BSL interpreters are expensive and in short supply. Without funding or a miracle, I could not hope to campaign on a level playing field with other candidates. When I heard about the access to elected office fund, I felt that I had found my light at the end of the tunnel to make my impossibility, the chance to run for local council, a reality. By providing full support and funding for BSL interpreters to support me during my campaign, the access to elected office fund has eradicated the barriers I would have previously faced running for local council. It has been instrumental and sensational in making history by helping me become the first duly elected BSL user councillor in Scotland. In 2021 parliamentary elections, there were 28 applicants to the fund. 14 were selected by their political party or as independents. Unfortunately, no fund recipients were elected. However, this election was marked as having the most diverse group of MPs elected to Parliament ever in Scotland. Although we don't have official figures, we're aware of at least six MSPs that define as disabled people, which is a marked increase. This was helped by other work that we were involved in, in committing political parties to look at their internal candidate selection mechanisms and use them to, to increase disabled candidates. In the 2022 local authority elections, 46 uh, people, candidates, were recipients of, of the fund and 22 were elected. And the overall total spend for that was 114,000. At the minute, the access to elected office fund is part of the democratic process in Scotland. We hope it continues as such and are delighted to be able to share our experience on the international stage in the hope that it can become an international standard. Uh, I'd love for, for people to get in touch with us. Uh, we want to share our learning with you and we want to learn from you as well. Uh, and, and being at this conference today just reinforces the fact that we've got so much to learn from each other, so much to share uh, and that we're stronger together. Uh, as a movement of disabled people on the international stage, we can really lead the way uh, and do our best to increase participation at all levels in politics. I'm going to leave it there. I'd love to talk to you all day, uh, but I want time for, for questions. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ethan. I, I fear neither of us would be invited back as a moderator or speaker if we if we kept going all day. But thank you very much, and you kept within time, so gold star. Um, uh, now, last but not no means least, delighted to invite our final speaker of this panel, uh, Florian Sandon, who is the policy coordinator at the European Network on Independent Living. And I think you're joining us from Brussels, Florian, if I've if I've that correct. So the virtual floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much for giving me the floor and inviting me to this event. I am I am German, but I'm uh, I work from Brussels, and so I join you from from Belgium today. Um, 
Yes, so this is the first slide. Yeah. Okay, I have, uh, I'm connected, uh, I can move the slides uh, through an application your colleague gave me. I'd have to see if it's, if it's working. So I'm policy officer at the European Network on Independent Living, uh, INIL. INIL is a Europe-wide cross-disability NGO run by disabled people. Uh, we are a genuine DPO, meaning all our board members, um, all our members and all our board are disabled. We are politi a political organization uh, fighting, fighting for the rights of disabled people by lobbying politicians and public administrations. We're the European branch of the World Independent uh, Living Network, which originated in the United States in the 19, 1960s. And today, I would like to talk about um, participation of disabled people in politics in general, in, in the European elections in particular. Um, I will begin my contribution by talk about, talking about international human rights law. And um, then I will move on on how to this law is applied in practice and what we can do to improve the status quo. So uh, according to the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. And everybody, everyone is entitled to all rights and freedoms set forth in this declaration without distinction of any kind. According to Article 21, everyone has the right to take part in the government of his country directly or through freely chosen representation. The will of the people shall be expressed in periodic and genuine elections, which shall be universal and held by equal suffrage. In 2006, the UN General Assembly adopted the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. The convention did not create new human rights, but explained, explains how the Universal Declaration on Human Rights applies to disabled people. If all humans have the equal uh, if all humans have have to have equal enjoyment of rights, it follows that there must that there must not be any discrimination. Articles three and five of the convention oblige state parties to, to prohibit all discrimination on the basis of disability. Disabled people must not be excluded from any area of life non-disabled people have access to. But it's not enough just to bet discrimination. The, uh, the convention and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights oblige state parties to work proactively to identify and dismantle barriers. Article 29 on the participation in political and public life states that state parties shall guarantee to persons with disabilities, disabilities effective and full participation in political and public life on an equal basis with others, including the right and opportunity for persons with disabilities to vote and be elected. And alia by protecting the right of persons with disabilities to vote by secret ballot in elections and public referendum, referendums without intimidation and to stand for elections to effectively hold office and other public functions at all levels of government and facilitate the use of assistive and new technologies. It has to be ensured that voting procedures, facilities and materials are appropriate, accessible and easy to understand. The, the, the free expression of will has to be guaranteed. To this end, when necessary, at the request of the disabled person, it has to be allowed to vote by a person with the assistance of a person of their choice. When it comes to the European elections, there is currently no EU-wide recognition uh, of all citizens' right to stand, uh, to participate and to stand in the elections. Current legislation regulating the European elections allows member states to restrict the voting rights of the disabled people. However, in 2015, the European Court of Justice recognized the standalone right to vote in the European elections of all citizens. That in principle should include disabled people. I say in principle because the Universal Declaration of Human Rights also talks about all humans. However, then 
we needed the convention to clarify that disabled people are included in the this uh, terminology. Also, the Treaty on the Functioning of the EU and the EU Charter on Fundamental Rights state that all EU citizens have the right to participate in the European elections. In practice, the right of disabled people to participate in elections is not very well respected. At the recent event of ENIL, ENIL on political participation, the disabled member of the European Parliament, Stelius Kimporopoulos from Greece, talked about the barriers he had to overcome. To overcome. First one is high expenditures. During an election campaign, candidates have to travel far and wide to meet citizens and speak at events. Because public transportation uh, is often not accessible to disabled people, also not in Greece, and there is um, in Greece there is no publicly funded personal assistance, um, but also not in many other country, countries. MEP Kimbropoulos uh, had to incur high, incur high cost, high personal expenditures. Um, running for office would not have been possible for him without support by his family. Accessibility. MEP Kimbropoulos says he is in, when he is invited to an event, he often finds the venue inaccessible uh, with his wheelchair. He's a wheelchair user. He's then asked to speak remotely via a camera from a different room. room. Often he has to choose between getting it into a situation in which his dignity is being violated or refusing to participate in a public event. He said that during the first years as an MEP, the podium in the plenary was not accessible for him as a wheelchair user. He had to speak from his seat, which gave people the impression that his contribution was somehow less important. Then there's also denigration by colleagues. Other competing politicians claimed that people only voted for him because he felt they felt sorry for his impairment. According to the MEP, Getting and remaining in politics as a disabled person is hard, complex, expensive, and sometimes painful, which is a combination might explain why we only have seven disabled MEPs at the moment. Some other facts. Seven million people with intellectual disabilities will not be able to participate in the European elections 2024 due to information communication barriers which were explained in more detail by Alejandro. Party manifestos and ballot papers are not available and easy to read usually. Then hundreds of thousands of people with um, disabilities are legally prevented from voting or standing in elections due to uh, abusive guardians or due to legal capacity legislation. Our authorities tend to refuse to register disabled people to vote or to stand as candidate. People and institutions are usually not able to vote by, by law or uh, de facto because no ballot boots are provided. An example is that in Bulgaria, for uh, you cannot be included in the list you need to be uh, get into to be able to, to vote or to run as candidate. We had a, a speaker with an intellectual impairment at our event from Czechia who is allowed to vote, but um, uh, not to present himself as a candidate because he's under guardianship and he's working with lawyers to challenge um, the guardianship uh, before the courts. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, talking about uh, working with lawyers, this brings me to the third part of my presentation. <laughs> Um, as you all know, know, every five years, EU citizens are called upon to elect the European Parliament, um, which is the EU's only directly elected um, institution. Yes, it is time for disabled people to have better representation uh, in politics, so more is done to secure our rights. And uh, two of our partner, partner organizations of us, 
the Validity Foundation and the law firm Convington of Berlin LAP want to do something, um, and they want to do this through fighting uh, through legal channels um, for the right of disabled people to vote and to stand. Because of this, they are looking for disabled people to represent before court, to represent their rights. They have, next slide please. Yes, uh, the law firm, uh, validity into the law firm, they have uh, people with, um, one more slide please, then you can see, uh, yes, our two pictures are not uh, not not loading, um, I'm sorry. Um, well, they have, they you can, you would be able, you see, you see one person of the legal team at least. They have a legal team with lots of experience in litigation, including before, before the European Court of Justice. So, um, at the moment, they are looking for disabled people who feel um, or see that their right to, to vote or be elected is infringed upon, violated. And if you're a disabled person or you know a disabled person in this situation, they are asking you to, um, to get in touch with them. Um, could you go two slides back? One more. Thank you for the for the for uh, excuse for the, excuse the chaos. Yes, there you see the email address. If you're in this situation or you know someone, they're asking to to get in touch. Um, you can request um, additional information and explanation. And um, ideally, they would like to to find one or several people uh, to enter their program. Uh, who say, okay, um, please um, represent my case before the national court of my country, take um, the public authority, whatever is blocking my right um, to participate in politics, uh, bring them to court. Um, and they are hoping that the national court of the country will refer the, refer the case to the European Court of Justice. Um, in this case, uh, the ECJ, ECJ will have an opportunity to confirm um, your right um, to vote and stand, um, and thereby also set a legal precedence for the right of um, disabled people in general to, to vote and stand. They're hoping that it will also convince the, the Commission, the European Parliament and the Council to ensure that the new European election directive will really ensure um, the right of disabled people to participate in European elections and also perhaps oblige uh, or move governments to, to change national legislation. Right. I'm, I'm so sorry, Florian, we're just, the clock is against us. Could I ask you to, to wrap up there a little bit, if you could come to your, your last points? Uh, yes, so to date, to date, no one has, uh, I was almost at the end anyway, to date, no one has challenged the barriers preventing disabled people to participate in the European elections through legal challenge. So to, to supporting this initiative, it would make an, a really important contribution. Thank you for your attention. Super. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And I'm sure, ladies and gentlemen, you'll agree. Three fantastic interventions. And just before turning over to you, the audience, for a question, if I may um, abuse my, my, my position as moderator, could I just ask one question? I mean, we've, we've heard such a, a focus on the, uh, and understandably and correctly, the European Parliament elections. I know that the European Parliament is renewing its commitment to ensuring the equal participation of people with disabilities. Um, I've also seen, I think it was last week, the European Court of Auditors has said that the EU's disabilities policy is not doing enough for inclusion and, uh, uh, and, and having more uh, uh, access for people with disabilities in the wider political decision making. Alejandro, could I turn to you and see initiatives such as the Conference on the Future of Europe and more broadly, how would you rate um, the EU in terms of uh, ensuring a more designing and an inclusive policy for people with disabilities in terms of political decision making at a European level? Very easy question. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, it's difficult to assess because you need to uh, 
you need to take the uh, EU institutions as well a little bit um, separately because uh, with the European Commission we do feel that the attitude has evolved and progress is, um, is going ahead uh, with more and more services within the European Commission. It was for the first time in, in 2019 uh, the Commission appointed a Commissioner for Equality uh, with, whose mandate actually uh, in his uh, mission letter was to implement, to make sure the implementation of the UNCRPD. Back then, for example, we didn't know if the Commission would uh, release a new European disability strategy for the next decade, So, because the previous one was from 2010-2020. Uh, and, um, and the Commission, for the first time, they did a really robust consultation with, uh, with a meaningful uh, involvement of uh, the disability uh, movement in the development of such strategy uh, within, you know, the creation of a, um, of a group in which all CRPD focal points, including the, the European Commission, but also all member states are represented. This group is called Disability Platform, in which the, the disability movement, EDF, ENIL, um, other European members and other civil society organizations, we can actually get information from them on how they are implementing the, the, um, the strategy and also give inputs on the key flagship initiatives such as the disability card or the accessible EU center and so forth. So things are moving in the Commission but of course it's such a huge institution that is difficult to assess. Um, we do want the Commission to continue and actually to have a Directorate General on Equality and Fundamental Rights to really boost this, 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 uh, this, this work that they, they've started. So the, 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 the ratification, the universal ratification of the CRPD by the EU and by all member states has been really uh, critical in this regard. And then the Parliament is always very eager to, to cooperate with us and to really advance on our issues. It's also true, it's a minor detail, but their jobs are at stake every five years. So they are really open to, to collaborate with us. The Parliament has the long-standing disability intergroup of which EDF, we are the secretariat of this intergroup, uh, is not a formal a standing committee but it's a way for MEPs that are interested in disability matters to cooperate and, co and coordinate among them and also with the support of EDF we really make sure that they are always in contact with the, with the disability movement. But the problem is the council and the council in which uh, na you know, national governments, they are there deciding is not really transparent sometimes, it's really difficult to get engaged so it, this is where we really rely on our national members to make things uh, move forward. But then when they come to the future of Europe, then uh, we didn't feel that it was so inclusive to persons with disability. And we felt that that was a missed opportunity and how the Commission and the Parliament and the Council, because it was a joint initiative, yes. really made this, uh, this, um, this conference. It was a pity, which we did our best, but it was very challenging for persons with disabilities to be active in the conference on the future of Europe. And, and actually, having been uh, appointed following an open competition, I should just say that, uh, by, by the, the, the Irish government as the Irish national citizen representative, I spent a huge amount of time there in, in Brussels and Strasbourg, and, and I would fully concur with that. Thank you, Alejandro. No. Um, any questions for our panel from the audience and, and to whom are you addressing them? Um, do I, I don't see any raised hands. Sorry, the, the lights are the lights are, are very bright. Um, and I don't think uh, our NDA colleagues have said there's there's none coming in on uh, none has come in online. I heard a no, so I'm going to take that as an executive no. Um, listen, well, look, without further ado, I think uh, we'll try to, to get you all back, uh, back on time and uh, we'll be in efficient uh, panel five. Um, if I can, um, thank you very much to our excellent panel of speakers, ladies and gentlemen. Can I ask you to show your appreciation and applause? Thank you. Uh, really valuable uh, contributions from uh, both uh, Ethan uh, uh, in, in, uh, from Scotland, from Florian in, in Brussels and Alejandro here with us in Dublin. And just on my own behalf, I would like to, to thank uh, Aideen, Deirdre and, and all the NDA team for today's excellent, uh, excellent conference and to to, you know, I'm very grateful for the experience and expertise we've had with our, with our panel today and to thank you, your audience, for your, your attention. 
and I, I hope you enjoy the remainder of the conference. Thank you very much.